our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What's going on, Beacon Hill? How you doing this morning? Uh, great, great time of worship so far. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you're a guest with here, thanks for coming out. My name is Michael Moore, and I have the privilege of serving as the pastor of this awesome fellowship of believers here at Beacon Hill Church. Uh, I hope I've gotten a chance to meet you already. If I haven't, please stop by. I'll be hanging out on the street corner after service, and that might seem kind of weird to you. Uh, the pastor will hang out on the street corner. What might seem a little weirder than that is that I'll be hanging out by a horse trough outside <laughs> after service. Uh, the horse trough is not for the horses that will be coming for the Hopewell Christmas Parade later on. Uh, the horse trough is for those today who are following through believers' baptism, those who have been saved and are following through what Christ has done in their life. And I'm thankful to have another baptism day, church. Yeah. And we never, never take that for granted. Some people ask us, why do we do baptisms on uh, the corner of Route 10? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, it's out of necessity. Uh, we cannot have that much water flowing around this much electricity, especially <laughs> ones that we do not own. So, we thought it might not be a good idea. So, but secondly, uh, what better way than to highlight what Christ is doing here in Hopewell by having a baptism on the street corner? That is what our church is named after. Do you know that? We're, we're named after Matthew chapter 5. You are a city set on a hill, a light that cannot be hidden. Therefore, let your light shine so that others may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. We don't baptize on the street corner so people can be impressed about Beacon Hill Church. We baptize on the street corner to give glory to God and what only he can do is take people who are dead and make them alive. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes lives. It is that gospel I want to preach to you this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, it's preaching time. So go ahead and grab your Bibles and open them up with me to John chapter 19, where I'll be going through verses 1 through 16 this morning. Uh, if you've got a bulletin, that will not fly. Uh, I am behind on that, really, here at Beacon Hill. I just go, Holy Spirit, and take as many verses as God tells me to do that this week. So this week we're coming to the first 16 verses. If you do not have a copy of God's Word with you this morning, just raise your hand and one of the Beacon Hill team members will bring you a copy of God's Word. And if you don't have a copy of God's Word at home, please take it with you. It's our gift to you this morning. Secondly, if you want a copy of today's sermon manuscript, they have those with them as well. So please raise your hand and you can follow along. I've been told that I kind of speak kind of fast. And so if you want to dig deeper into the Scripture... Just uh, just get a manuscript or send me your email address. I'll be happy to get you on the weekly uh, uh, email distribution of the sermon. If you're able, I'd invite you to stand now in honor of reading God's holy word as I read John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16 this morning. John chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version of the Bible. The word of God says, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hell, King of the Jesus, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you know that I have the authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it has been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat him down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stove Pavement. And 
in Aramaic Gabbatha. That was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them over to be crucified. Let us pray. Dear Holy Father, as I prepare to proclaim your word this morning, Lord, the words in the scripture, they're not just words. These are things that happen. Lord, it hurts my heart to even hear them. But I know there's a purpose behind them. A purpose to give us life for those who would believe in you. Lord, that's the whole purpose of this gospel that you've given us. So those would believe that Jesus is the Christ. And by believing in them, they shall have life in your name. So, Lord, I pray this morning as I proclaim your word, I pray that you would speak through me, your servant, allow me to preach with boldness and with clarity and conviction of speech. Lord, that the hearts of the hearers would receive it. I pray that if someone is here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that they would not walk out of here lost, but understanding that they can be saved and today is the day of salvation for them. Lord, I thank you for the hope that is in Christ Jesus. Lord, may I decrease and you increase now as I proclaim your word. In Jesus' holy and precious name we praise you. Amen. You may be seated. I have entitled today's sermon, It Should Have Been Me. It Should Have Been Me. Christmas is a time where we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. If you are new here at Beacon Hill or have been visiting us here for a couple of weeks, it might be strange to you that we're actually preaching on the death of and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ here at Beacon Hill in the month of December. We do that for a couple of reasons. One, here at Beacon Hill Church, we walk verse by verse through Scripture, and we're currently going through John. We have been going through John since 2016. We'll wrap it up in 2019, and we find ourselves at this point in Scripture, in God's providence, right here in December. So part of it is because we walk right through the books of the Bible, but there's another reason to preach this text during Christmas time. And that's because you cannot possibly appreciate the birth of Jesus Christ without his death, church. His birth isn't meaningless without his death. It is why he came. He was born to die so that you and I can live. So I pray that through studying this passage over the next couple of weeks, that Christmas to you will be more meaningful than it ever has. Because it won't be just about a, a baby that was born in a manger. It's about a man who came down from heaven and gave his life on the cross of Calvary so that we could have eternity in heaven. Let's dig into this gospel this morning. And the first thing that I want you to see from the first six verses is that the gospel is not about an emotional response. The gospel is not about an emotional response. It's not about sharing this word for the next 30 minutes and then trying to pull on your heartstrings here at invitation time. That's not what the gospel is about. We will have an invitation today. We will have an opportunity for you to come and, and pray with us and to share what is on your heart, but we're not sharing this for the sole purpose of, of just pulling on your emotional heartstrings. Because you know what? An emotional response will not last. An understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ will last forever, church. Amen. So I pray that we understand that this morning. Jesus' own people. Matter of fact, if it could have been about an emotional response, what you're about to hear through the first six verses of Scripture would have certainly garnered an emotional response. When you sit here and look at it, Jesus' own people, the Jews, were seeking to have him crucified. Pilate couldn't find any guilt in him. As we studied last week, Pilate was trying to find a way to release Jesus. And he, he thought, man, here's a good idea. It's this tradition in Passover that we release a, a prisoner. So he gave the crowd a choice. Would he release Jesus? Or would they choose to release the most violent criminal that he had in his prison, a guy named Barabbas, and the crowd cried out, we want Jesus crucified. And Barabbas was set free while Jesus was kept in prison. 
Pilate went to plan B. He, he thought if this didn't work, he was going to go another level to try to set Jesus free. He thought he would appeal to their emotional thoughts, their, their moral responsibility. He, he thought that by doing the things you're going to read in the first three verses of Scripture, they would just have their heart pulled so much that they would set Jesus free. So Pilate flogged Jesus. I want you to know that there's three types of flogging that is uh, was prescribed in the Roman culture. One is called fustigation. One is called flagellation, and I can't pronounce the third one, so you don't need to worry about it. But it says like this: it is literally goes from this minor beating. You ever had your parents just like slap you and say, "Don't do that again." And then you have that time where you were close to death for the beating that you were taking. I mean, we don't get to do that and then call CPS or something like that. But we didn't have that growing up. It was free game that I was growing up. So you can see the different levels of beatings that were going on. And so it doesn't say in Scripture what type of flogging that Jesus got, but you would think it was in this intent for a pal to release him. He, he gave the least of the beatings that he could. But I want you to kind of understand that even the least of this flogging was just absolutely unbearable. The weapon of choice for a floggy was this leather whip, knotted and weighted with pieces of metal or bone. It would literally, as he flogged Jesus, stick to his skin, rip open the skin to the veins and the arteries, show it to the bones. This is the most minor form of flogging, and Jesus was taking this beating straight from Pilate. Can you imagine our Savior sitting there getting beat, watching his skin be torn. Somebody had to step up and say, enough, yet. That wasn't. This is just verse 1, folks. You look at verse 2, and they take a crown of thorns, and they, they put it around his head, and when you see this pretty picture of it, and it's not that pretty what you see, but it's prettier than what it is in reality. This crown of thorns was made out of date palms. And these date palms literally had thorns that could be 12 inches long. And they stuck it into Jesus' skull. And blood started coming down his head. Here he is with his skin ripped open. He's got blood coming down. And no one is sitting there saying, release this man. Yet we see in verse 3 that the soldiers came by. One by one, mocking Jesus, slapping Jesus in the face, saying, Hail, the King of the Jews. One after another, Hail, the King of the Jews. Church, this just hurts me to know what our Savior went through. Pilate thought that if any crowd could be moved to pity, it would be this crowd. You see, by looking through Scripture, everything that Jesus had been through. He is slapped in the face by Annas. He was spit on and beat before Caiaphas. Pilate beat him. The soldiers mocked him. Surely, if anybody had suffered enough and seen this eyewitness, they would say, let him go. But yet, they shouted out, crucify him, crucify him. Church, if sinners who saw Christ go through this did not repent, if sinners who saw Christ flogged did not repent, if sinners who, who saw the, the date palms just go into his skull did not repent, if sinners who saw him get slapped over and over did not repent, what hope is it 2,000 years later for people who may have only read about this in Scripture or never even heard the name of Jesus Christ? Church, this world needs Jesus Christ more than ever, whether or not they know it or not. Amen. We're not saved by feeling pity because of what Jesus Christ went through. We are saved by repenting of our sins and trusting in Christ, the sinless Savior, the substitute who came so that we could live. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't mean that it's not okay to have this emotional heartstrings this morning for what you just heard. It, it hurts my soul to even tell you this, but this is what happened to Jesus. And so this is the time, literally, we'll have communion later on to just meditate how much our Savior went through so that you can know Him. What a blessing, church. 
At the same time, for believers here, it should, it should move you to sacrifice. Do you know that Jesus Christ called us to follow him? You know, I get, I get mocked. Not the way that Jesus gets mocked. I get mocked because we have baptisms 12 months a year here. No, why can't you wait till summer to baptize people? When I read the Bible, Jesus says, follow me. He doesn't say, follow me in the summertime, follow me in the springtime. He said, follow me when you come to me. Pick up your cross and follow me. This is what the Bible says. So just meditate on this. What is Christ calling you to do? What sacrifice is Christ calling you to do? As C.T. Studd said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, there is no sacrifice too great for me to make for him. Yeah. So the gospel is not about an emotional response. It's about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our, our sins. But secondly, church, the gospel is not about fear mongering. And that's a huge word for me to use in the service because I don't know how to say it. But when you look through scripture, it actually, not only when you look through scripture, but when you look in this world today, do people try to use fear as a form of getting what they want? Oh, yeah. Do they try to instill this, this fear in, in your life? The, the world will tell you what they believe, and they will get louder and louder and make more threats until they get what they want. But the gospel is not about making threats, church. It's about saving sinners. Pilate was afraid of the crowd. And he was afraid at Jesus. He was a leader in name only because he was literally instilled and gripped by fear for what was happening. After his second plan backfired, he heard the crowd chant louder and louder, crucify him, crucify him, having no pity on Jesus. Well, they heard the words and he was trying to make himself clean of what was going on. The one who had the authority to let Jesus go was gripped by fear for what the crowd was crying out. They weren't going to rest until Jesus was crucified. They threatened him in many ways. They said, our law says that this man ought to die for making himself the son of God. For the first time, they presented the actual claim that they had against Jesus, that he was making himself the son of God. Jesus didn't make himself the son of God. He is the son of God. Church. So you sit here and we see in scripture that Pilate was more afraid. Pilate had heard the claim. Don't gloss over what it says here. He was more afraid. This man who was perceived power stood in fear and now this fear had begun to paralyze him. Do you know, has anybody ever here suffered with anxiety? You know, I suffer with anxiety. And sometimes when you get more anxious about things, you know what it does? It shuts down your body. You don't even know how to move. You don't even know how to act. You are not. You are just a shell of yourself. You're sitting here and you can picture what Pilate is going through. He was literally instilled with fear. Pilate has a lot going on. He has a crowd that is increasingly moving towards, if they're not already there, and mob status. He goes on to say scripture was more afraid once he heard that this man Jesus was claiming to be son of God. He says he was more afraid. You know, we don't say why in scripture that he was more afraid. But back in these days, they had all these myths about gods who would come down from, from heaven and the earth. And, and so he didn't know what to think. But I can imagine if he heard the son of God. It had to instill some fear in him that if this man, Jesus Christ, was the Son of God, he just slapped and scourged and mocked the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's not good, folks. On top of that, he had just received a message from his wife. If you look at Matthew 27, it's, it's awesome to see. He actually got a message delivered to him from his wife. She said, you know what? I have a dream about this man, Jesus. You know, I don't know if I'm going to get a message delivered to me. I'm probably going to want it delivered to me before I smack Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And yet he got this message from his wife. And this is what it says in Matthew 27, 19. It says, she sent word for her husband to have nothing to do with that righteous man. Do you see what she called him? righteous man? She said, nothing to do with this righteous man. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. 
Jesus was actually coming to her in a dream, and she knew this man was righteous. Do you know the number one way Muslims come to Christ today is through dreams? And yet we see in Scripture that Matthew 27, his own wife was sitting there telling him that this man was righteous and to get away from him. So he comes back to Jesus. He goes, where are you from? And when Jesus didn't answer, you know what he tried to do? He tried to do the same thing that the crowd did. He tried to instill fear into Jesus. He goes, do you not understand that I have the authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus said, you have no authority over me unless it's been given to you from above. In other words, God is still in charge regardless of what you think. When you see all the hate and the fear mongering and people trying to silence Christianity, you don't have to fear any man because God is still on the throne, church. So let me share with you a few thoughts about this passage. The world tries to instill fear, but the gospel instills God's love. Jesus gave him all the information he needed to believe and, and trust in him. His own wife called him a righteous man, and they kept her up at night. Yet the pressures of the world were gripping him. And instead of running after trusting Jesus, he sat there silent. Jesus didn't say, man, you're going to hell. He didn't say you have all the information you need to make a choice on your own. He just sat there and already presented the truth to him. You know, church, when I look at this world today, I'm not the least bit concerned about what this world will try to do to Christ. The city can come and shut us down from preaching the gospel here in a, in a city building, but you know what I'll do? I'll go outside and keep preaching Jesus Christ. Amen. The government can try to make threats to kid Christianity, but they are not my final authority. So don't get all worked up when you see people antagonizing Christ on Facebook or whatever. Look how Jesus handled it. Jesus gave him all the truth he needed, but he found that Jesus wasn't going to force him to believe. He wasn't going to say, you're making the biggest mistake in your life. He was a prophet, so yes, but Jesus wasn't forcing anyone into heaven. Do you understand that Jesus allows us to make our own choice? What I'm doing here today is I'm simply presenting you the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I am not going to force you to come to Christ. It's up to you to make the decision of whether or not you believe in this gospel that I'm preaching this morning. So I want you to see through scripture that the gospel is personal, church. The gospel is personal, verses 12 through 16. Jesus says, Caiaphas has the greater sin. Jesus said, Caiaphas has the greater sin. Why is that? Why is Caiaphas the one who has the greater sin? Was it because he was a corrupt high priest that, that didn't give Jesus a fair trial? No, Caiaphas had the greater sin because he knew Scripture and had every opportunity to examine the truth of Scripture like you and I do here today. Every single one of you here today has seen Scripture up here. It is in your hands. We are not going to leave anybody out of here today without a copy of the Word of God if you want one. We're not going to force you to take it. Yet, if you choose to close your eyes to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and harden your heart, it's not on me, church. It's a personal decision you're making today. Yet, we look at Pilate. Pilate was a pagan who didn't know the scriptures. He, he wasn't brought up with knowledge of the scripture, but he also faced the same decision of what to do with this man he was hearing about. But he was trying to wash his hands before the crowd of what they are doing with Jesus. But his heart wasn't clean, and he was equally choosing to deny Jesus. And you have the Jews who will tell you that they're the chosen ones. And they're going to heaven just because they are Jews. Yet many of them are missing Jesus Christ who is right in front of them. The gospel says that there is no one without excuse. From the one who is in church every Sunday to those who don't believe in Jesus, to those who have never heard about Jesus, there is not a single person who is breathing today that has an excuse. Jesus won't say you're a good person, come on in. Jesus won't say that you've done a lot of good things, come on in. Jesus won't say, I know you were busy and you meant to come to church, come on in. Jesus will know whether or not you have repented of your sins and trusted him as Lord of your life. And that is how you're going to have the church. You can fool the world. You can dress all nice and neat. But you can't fool Jesus, church. You can fool the world, but you can't fool Jesus. So when you look at what Jesus went through, 
everything that I've described to you today, you should realize this very important truth that I want to leave you with and that I'm going to ask you to respond. The truth of this message is it should have been you. It, it should have been you that was flawed. It should have been you that had big palms coming through your skull. It should have been you to get slapped over and over again. It should have been you up on that cross. Do you get that this morning? Right. It should have been me. But Jesus Christ loved you so much. He loved me so much that he sat there and willingly gave his life on the cross of Calvary so that whoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. I can tell you what, that's the greatest love story ever told, church. So I don't know what Christ has done in your life today. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, but I know this, that the gospel does not return void. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. We're going to sit here for the next two songs, and we're going to have a tablet invitation. It's something we can pray for you about, something that you just want to know more about this Jesus, whatever. We just want to share with you the truth today. But you know what? The invitation to come to Jesus doesn't end just after these next five or six minutes. Whenever and whenever you want to talk about Jesus Christ, we want to point you to scriptures and how you can have a relationship with Christ. But I can tell you this, that you're not guaranteed tomorrow. You're not guaranteed the next second. But you guarantee this chance right now to turn your life into Jesus. So let us pray. Dear Holy Father, I thank you and I praise you for who you are. I thank you for being the God who loves us. Lord, to sit there and to think how much you were just hit and mocked and scourged, Lord. And over and over again, you went through all that stuff so that we could live. Lord, I pray that we would completely understand that this morning. Lord, that we wouldn't just gloss over that truth. Lord, that we would trust in you for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, I pray this morning that people have really received this word this morning. Lord, I, I hope I've glorified you through preaching it. But Lord, I know it's up to the Holy Spirit to make the hearts of the hearers. It's nothing I can say or do. So Lord, it's time to respond. May you get all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please.